All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Mindgasms. Got Jared Bauer, formerly of Wisecrack, back here today. And we're going to talk about Slavoj Zizek and so on. Oh, wow. I've already got three viewers. People must love Zizek. That's awesome. <laughs> so so we're going to talk about Slavoj Zizek, of course, which uh, a lot of people have heard of. But if you're not like uh, philosophy nerds like us, he's a kind of famous uh, Hegelian and Lacanian and Marxist philosopher. And I first heard about him, and probably a lot of people did too, from his uh, debate with Jordan Peterson about Marxism and capitalism and postmodernism. And it seems like, uh, like I was saying before we started, it seems like his main influences are Hegel, Marx, and Lacan. And he has a lot of really interesting ideas about all kinds of things, like his view on ideology, for example. So, yeah, to start off with, um, I guess, well, what I think we might have touched on this briefly before, but what did you, um, I guess, what did you think about that Jordan Peterson debate? And then what, what, did, uh, what attracted you to Zizek in the first place? Yeah, so I loved the Peterson Zizek debate mostly because I think Zizek took the high ground and kind of took the opportunity to really show Peterson's fan base what his thesis is mostly about. You know, and when I say his thesis, I think his main thesis that is in all of his books is talking about what is called like the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Uh, that are going to be brought along by the uh, contradictions of capitalism. Um, and I, it, it's biogenetics, uh, increasing inequality, ecology, and new forms of apartheid, I think, are the four. And I think that, you know, Zizek is brilliant. He's probably, and I hope no one's offended by this, he's also probably on the spectrum somewhere. And so he sometimes is really hard to follow. And I think he did an actually really good job of being very concise in that debate, which is not really saying a lot. So I think that he did a really good job of also presenting the left as not this woke, scolding, super puritanical, uh, politically correct club. And yeah, the last thing he said in the debate was you can be part of the left and not be politically correct, which is something that I don't think we hear enough of. And yeah, so yeah, for sure. In terms of how I first heard about him, I actually first heard about him through his love for movies because The Pervert's Guide to Ideology was something that I had seen a poster for and I was like, I don't, what is this? It's like a documentary. It's a movie. I don't know who this guy is. And it wasn't until during the Wisecrack days, a particular writer on 8-Bit Philosophy told me about him and then told me that I should go watch The Pervert's Guide to Ideology, and I did. And after that, I was, like, hooked on Zizek. Have you seen it? Oh, no, I, I actually didn't realize that was also a documentary. I totally have to watch that. Oh, cool. Well, it's kind of a documentary. It's basically a video essay. Oh, okay. A feature-length video essay. Oh, okay. Where can I find it? So you can definitely find it on Amazon. I think you might have to pay to rent it. Um, I think it might have been on. It depends. It, it could be on Netflix, depending on where you are. It was on Netflix at one point. But, you know, they everything is different depending on the uh, area that you're in. Yeah, yeah. I know, but, like, uh, it's different for me in Canada than it is for my friends in the U.S. And I'm, I'm sure it's probably different for you in Finland there, too. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So what were some of uh, like what were some of his takes on some particular movies that you thought were interesting? So he doesn't really analyze the movies it, contra to wisecrack and where we would try to analyze what we thought there was evidence to suggest the movie was saying he is analyzing movies through his particular theory of ideology, basically suggesting, basically taking movies, certain scenes from movies, and showing how they kind of animate his ideas about ideology. 
So the one example that opens the movie that he talks about constantly is the John Carpenter movie, They Live. Uh, I don't know if you've seen that, uh, but the premise is basically that the main character stumbles upon a box of sunglasses. And when you put on the sunglasses, it shows you kind of the hidden message behind the reality. So for example, there's an advertisement that is a, it's an ad for a hotel chain or some kind of a resort. And it's a beautiful woman at the beach. And then he puts on the glasses and the image of the beautiful woman reads, Mary reproduce obey or something like that. And oh yeah, I think I've uh, I, I've actually seen um, uh, a conversation that he was doing with someone on on YouTube from years ago where they were they were talking about that movie and they showed a clip from it. So that's why I mentioned before and I forgot to do that. I was gonna wear sunglasses to show that I can see the true world. <laughs> okay, yeah, there you go. Yeah. Um, so. I mean, that that one example uh, is probably the the clearest one. Uh, then he does he comments on everything from the sound of music to Rammstein to old Soviet movies to oh. and then there's a whole no, there's a whole nother movie called The Pervert's Guide to Cinema, which I think is a two parter and is altogether like four and a half hours long. It's not as good as The Pervert's Guide to Ideology. And that one is particularly more Lacanian than Pervert's Guide, which I think you could say is more Marxist, uh, but still really good stuff. And the movies that he chooses in the Pervert's Guide to Cinema, I think, are a bit more obscure. And his overall, his arguments are a bit harder to follow. But really, I really, really recommend the Pervert's Guide to Ideology. Yeah, everything Sweet. from Rammstein, Beethoven, uh, Kubrick, uh, Scorsese. It's it's a film oh, wow. heaven. Yeah. Oh wow! If you, if you like film and philosophy, I mean, yeah, he's such a big inspiration for me for a number of reasons. I mean, it's not only that the guy loves movies and the guy loves philosophy and that he hates political correctness, but also he often calls himself a clown. But really, he just has this aesthetic of a philosopher that he just really nails. There's just something about listening to him. There's something about his demeanor that's a little bit gross, a little like just so so radically rough around the edges that you would expect uh, like a brilliant, you know, a, a brilliant thinker to be in the sense that, you know, the stereotype of a brilliant mind that is so concerned with content, he doesn't have time for artifice. So he, you know, has like barbecue stained shirts and is constantly sweating and sniffing and everything like that. So yeah, he yeah. Is, <laughs> I, I've heard him He's always do that sniffing thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've heard him called the Elvis of philosophy, and I think that that's a really uh, interesting description and an apt description because he is a rock star. He's a philosophy rock star. And it's not only the content of his positions, but also he's just, uh, you know, it, the, the, the fashion, the style that he wears makes him uh, very seducing to listen to. Yeah, I, li I like his... Uh his kind of anti-establishment mindset that it seems to be embodied in his, his, his aesthetic, as you were saying, the, like he's, and, uh, and, and like being, being so smart that you're kind of like disconnected from the world a little bit. And like, almost, almost like you're on the autism spectrum. Like you said, I, right. I kind of like his whole, his whole mannerisms about that, which is why I just, I always, find his takes on things to be interesting even if i disagree with the conclusion the argument for it is just so interesting it's coming from totally unexpected angles and i i just uh, like you said too um the uh, one of the cool things about him also is that he's like he's a self-proclaimed marxist but he really hates all this wokeness and cancel culture shit which is really awesome too of course I think that his him labeling himself a Marxist is a little bit of a troll because that's another I thing think so about too. Zizek. Yeah, that's another thing about Zizek is he's got such a great sense of humor, and that's also something yeah. that I really appreciate about him. I mean, I'm really a, a Zizek fanboy. There's not really a lot that he said that I virulently disagree with. I mean, there are even debates with him where he debates libertarians, where he's in agreement 
with the libertarians for most of it. Um, and so, you know, he's really not afraid to uh, transgress certain ideological lines. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I've heard him like I've heard him say sometimes that he's like obviously jokingly that he's a Stalinist and then other times that he's not a Stalinist and then sometimes jokingly and sometimes seriously saying that he's a communist. So I, I totally get that trolling aspect of that for sure. Yeah, the only real marks that I can identify in his positions, and again, we talked about, we mentioned this before we started recording, he's got like over 30 books, so there's a lot to get in there, supposedly. He also repeats himself a lot. But mm -hmm. one is the idea of the commons, which uh, in a very simple sense is... Uh, you know, like with ecology, for example, the idea of the commons of like all of our common environment that we must fight for and that is important and is not something that is has a, an incentive very structure within capitalism to preserve. Uh, but then also things like uh, genetic code, which is why he talks about uh, biogenetics, like the idea that um, the uh, common landscape of what is human is that something that we can all you know and his his thesis is like yeah having a global government sounds kind of scary but when we have these problems like ecology and like biogenetics that are coming what is the, what's the other option you know we're gonna have to have something like that and so yeah. you know there's the marxist idea of the commons that he's more or less is kind of waving his hands around saying like hey we have to use this lens if we're not going to get blindsided by one of these problems. But then the other one, obviously the big one that he's harping on all the time is ideology. And yeah, and, and definitely that's his most interesting position. It's also the most difficult one to explain. Um, you know, whereas Marx would have said that ideology is kind of the false consciousness thing where they know not what they do. Zizek, and so let me just slow down and explain that a little bit more, like in the sense that they're doing something and they don't even, they're not even aware of what they're doing in, uh, so for example, well, yeah, like as Lenin would say, like false consciousness, like, you know, you are acting out behavior that you are more or less conditioned to do and you are conditioned by an ideology that basically owns you. Zizek will often talk about this Niels Bohr joke. Do you know what I'm talking about? I'm not sure. So I know he joke tells jokes is, a lot. I'm not sure I remember yeah, that one. Yeah. So the Niels Bohr joke is, so Niels Bohr is a famous physicist or scientist or something. And one of his friends comes over and sees a dream catcher on top of, uh, above Niels Bohr's bed. And he says, what is this? You actually believe in this shit? And Niels Bohr says, of course I don't actually believe in it, but I've been told it works even if you don't believe in it. And he says that that's how ideology works today. Um, and I think that is, and I think that's actually quite profound. And I think that even in our last discussion on your channel, when we discussed uh, the James Lindsay stuff and we discussed how people are, adopting opinions that they don't even understand because i mean i i guess i could uh, i could translate that example into let's say somebody says um for example if somebody had uh, this is a bad example but let's say somebody had like a black lives matter uh thing over their bed and someone would say do you actually believe that and someone would say uh, no, but I've been told that it's the right, or, or I've been told that it's the morally just thing to do, even if you don't believe in it or something like that. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, I think, sure. I think that's a, I think that's a bad example, but, um, so well, the, like, I know you're, I know you're not a big fan of Twitter, but I follow a lot of people on Twitter who say black lives matter in their Twitter profiles and it doesn't seem relevant to anything they're doing. <laughs> well, yeah, because they feel like they have to announce their tribal position otherwise, or maybe they're trying to uh, exclude certain people from engaging with them, or they're just trying to say that like, hey, this is an essential part of my identity. It's non-negotiable. I, I, I don't know. It's not something I would do. 
yeah. even though I'm very, you know, obviously very sympathetic towards, you know, police violence against African Americans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That that's part of the problem. Like, uh, like in terms of Slav Slavoj Zizek, like you, in, that's part of the problem with ideology in the way it functions. Like we see a lot of that in our culture today, where the problem is the messaging. Like, it, it, sim Black Lives Matter is similar to defund the police as as a reaction to the George George Floyd murder by a cop, right? Where defund the police like everyone on the right wing assumed that it means the most the least charitable interpretation like abolishing all cops and stuff like that and then uh people who actually support that label mean different things by it some of them actually do mean that but then some of them also mean like demilitarizing the police and having mental health workers accompany a cop if they're dealing with a home a homeless person with mental health problems or like there's no consistent messaging on it so it can be it can be it can like ideologize ideologize people who support that position and also people who are against it because there's so much confusion does that make right. sense yeah and i just want to so i think i just want to make this point saliently like Whereas Marx would say they know not what they do, Zizek would say the way that ideology functions today is that they know what they do and they do it anyway. So, for example, in the oh, Niels okay. Bohr example, Niels Bohr knows that the uh, that the Dreamcatcher is bullshit, but he still performs having the Dreamcatcher there because, you know, supposedly it works anyway. Um, mm -hmm. So. Those are the two, and like even his ideology or his take on ideology is such a significant departure from Marx that, you know, to Peterson's point in the debate, he could almost call himself a Zizekian. But the commons and ideology are kind of the two big uh, Marx influences that are most present in Zizek's uh, points, as far as I've read. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think it's interesting too cuz I've heard him say before that he's a Hegelian and a Marxist and Lacanian, but I think he I think he's said that he's a Marxist last and a Hegelian first and then a Lacanian and if I remember correctly, he wanted to he he wanted to like kind of reverse the um what Marx did when he when he flipped Hegel's dialectic it was I think on it on its head and wanted to go back from that so he's li like I don't remember whether it was the dialectic or ideology actually but I think he wanted to go back to the Hegelian take on that and apply that Hegelian take to Marxism I think so yeah I mean Hegel was the dialectic Marx was ideology um, and then you know Marx's addition to Hegelianism was the, the materialist version of it um, I'm not entirely, I, I don't exactly know what you're referring to, but I mean, again, there's just, he has such a large body of work. The other two influences that I would mention that he is constantly citing is Kierkegaard and Chesterton, which, right. uh, you know, which also makes him a very interesting thinker to me because he has an appreciation for the religious apologetics, apologeticists. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Chesterton is interesting in that way too. And I also, um, uh, I read a book about him a long time ago where in which he was criticizing eugenics in like the 1920s or something like that, when basically everyone thought it was legitimate science. So I, mm. I thought that was a, that was a really interesting book. And then he also, um, like you said, uh, there's some uh, he does some religious apologism too, and uh, and Kierkegaard is interesting too. Like Kierkegaard and Chesterton and Hegel and Lacan and Marx, it's a really interesting collection of influences, as often happens with really interesting philosophers, because that's what they kind of tend to do, right? They take ideas from different thinkers that they like and com combine them into their own kind of like way of approaching subjects and then reject some aspects of them which is why it can be so difficult to 
apply labels to philosophers because sometimes they even label themselves a certain way, but other people wouldn't even agree with that label they apply to themselves. And, and in terms of that uh, debate with Jordan Peterson too, uh, that was one thing that one of many things that I think got me into um, like actually reading more classic Marxism too. And even like the obscure shit, like capital volume one and stuff like that. And, uh, and then also watching more like lefty uh, YouTube channels, like Ben Burgess, who we both talked to about um, and learning about how there are different types of Marxism. And, you know, like I didn't even, I had no idea that, you know, people who often criticize Marxism tend to lump all of the different types together, like as if every type of Marxism is this authoritarian, totalitarian, like Stalinism and Maoist China, ra rather than um, the uh, democratic control of companies like worker co-ops and stuff like that, like more like what democratic socialists or libertarian socialists was ta would talk about. Yeah, it, it's a little bit of a mess. Um, and and even these days, you hear a lot of people on the right side of the culture war will use the term Marxism to describe any heuristic that has one group being the uh, oppressor and then the other group being the oppressed. And, and that's because yeah. of Peterson. And yeah. Because, you know, the reason why there was never really a big explosive disagreement about the term postmodern neo-Marxism in that debate is because Peterson is basically just like imposing his own framework of understanding Marxism onto, uh, you know, this woke movement. And so, yeah. yeah, I mean, I mean, it's a mess. Like, it's the same thing yeah. with last time we talked about postmodernism. Like, we're all talking about different shit with that word. And yeah. even as Zizek pointed out, like most people will use the term Marxism, maybe not to talk about the uh, oppressor versus oppressed, but to talk about absolute equality or absolute egalitarianism. And as Zizek pointed out in the debate, Marx explicitly was against that. But mm -hmm. it just doesn't matter yeah. because, again, like Ben will tell you, there's even Marx himself before he died hated Marxists. So, like, there's just all these different meanings that mm -hmm. are lumped into that word that it's yeah, it's a mess. Yeah. Well, and yeah, like that's a, that's one of the main problems, like acting like all of these terms are monoliths, like Marxism means this one thing. And then all of these other things also mean Marxism and wokeness is like Marxism and postmodernism and critical theory and critical race theory, because apparently they're all of these different ideologies. And then, but, but then like, like we were talking about too, like even people who apply these labels to themselves, they disagree about all sorts of stuff too. And, and like that postmodern neo-Marxist label, that was an interesting part of the debate too, because uh, Slavoj Žižek said something like, I know what you mean by this. Like he basically means woke people, but he's, he said, so who are these postmodern neo-Marxists though? Like he couldn't name anyone who has this ideology because it's kind of like this vague sense of, you know, people who use all the, all those keywords that we know about, like, like, uh, I don't know, like oppression and transphobia and, uh, Black Lives Matter and racism and all of those keywords and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, look, I think that what Peterson says makes sense. I think what we're really all disagreeing about here is what's the responsible way to frame this problem? Because it seems like by framing it the way that Peterson does, we're framing it in a way that is antagonizing um, like very rich movements of thought that have mm -hmm. a variety of helpful things that can lead us to productive insights about where we are as a culture and as like a, a global experiment. But yeah, that's, that that's can... kind of like, that's kind of like what I was saying before is my problem with that sort of thing. Right. It's just not framing it in a productive way. Yeah. But again, like, it, and that's all this is. It's like, how do you want to frame this? Like postmodern neo-Marxism 
okay, yeah, he explains it. It makes sense, but but like why scapegoat these two very, very complex modes of thought? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like you it's easy it's easy to critique some of these specific ideas that they mention without like lumping lumping it all into like basically demoni demonizing like left wing ideas or particular realms of philosophy that you don't like like for for one thing i don't i can't find that many people that say there's no biological difference between a man and a woman but if someone says that claim it's pretty easy to refute you don't need to like add all this other shit to it right yeah this other uh, okay so something i wanted to bring up before i forget so this idea of like you know how important it is that we frame these terms in responsible ways. So something that uh, Ben Shapiro often says is whenever somebody asks him, do you believe that systemic racism is a real thing? He'll say, well, do I believe that history has consequences? Yes. Now, mm -hmm. what he's saying, I think, is an accurate description of what systemic racism is. However, the Pretty way much, he yeah. frame, yeah, but however, the way he frames it makes is very unproductive because basically the idea that history having consequences is so redundant that when you frame it that way, we basically say, oh, okay, well then we shouldn't do, there's nothing we can do because it's history. We can't change history. We can't change history having consequences. So there's nothing we can do. So all these, you know, problems within our police department and other form and other systems in society, we should just throw our hands up and do nothing about it. That's mm -hmm. what's at stake here is that calling it systemic racism, at least has a call to action in it that maybe we can put some effort into it to fix it. And I think that's really the only disagreement that people on the left and the right have from that position that Shapiro asserts because. Yeah. Yeah. They don't I like do the label. Like we were talking about like defund right. the police or black lives matter. Right. But ultimately it's, I mean, it's a weird thing in that Shapiro and the left agree on the definition of the term but framing, but they disagree on how to frame it because, you know, how you frame it determines whether or not people should do anything about it. At least that's what I think. Yeah, yeah, I think that I think that's true. That that seem that seems like it makes sense. And the and that's why that's why it's a problem to demonize these sorts of ideas. Like we we were talking a little bit before about critical race theory and like. That's one thing I've been learning a lot about too. Is that uh, like we were talking about before? It's not, it's not a monolith, and it's not all like this fucking uh, Robin D'Angelo, white fragility, Ta-Nehisi Coates, Ibram X Kennedy type of stuff. <laughs> like if you if you consider if you consider that critical race theory, that's like the that's like the I don't know like uber stalinist version of critical race theory like it's but like a lot of it is people actually trying to solve these like problems of racially racially disparate outcomes and and then another another aspect of this that i think um uh i think i've probably heard uh, seen slavoj zizek talk about before and uh and ben burgess was talking with me about this when i was talking about it last uh last time with him too that um it's one one perhaps valid criticism that you can make of critical race theory is that sometimes they can focus too much on race and not enough on class issues too that affect both affect all colors of people and if you try to address those they can account for some of the problems due to racial disparities too which i think is also true yeah and i would also uh, lump trans issues in there. I think that when people talk about how trans people are in danger of violence more than any other minority, I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that a lot that the, the poverty statistics among black trans people are terrifying. And of course, they would be in safer positions if they lived in better neighborhoods, if they had more stable jobs, if they had, you know, like more safety nets and education to rely on. So, yeah, I mean, I think that, again, instead of freaking out about Dave Chappelle, which is totally a distraction, we yeah. should be talking about this through a, a class lens, because I think that 
that's the best way to lift the trans community as well as all these other communities up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, uh, like this stuff with just like thinking you're an activist because you're bullying people on Twitter is not helping anyone. It's just making problems worse. Like if I, w if I actually believed as strongly in these ideas as some people do, I would think that I would, I don't know, go and join protests or something like that. At least I bet the, I bet a lot, a very small percentage of Twitter SJWs actually go and join protests. And for those of them who do good for those people. Sure. I mean, I would go further than that. I mean, I would say for, I mean, you know, I know a handful of people who, you know, are like trust fund kids who bully people on Twitter instead of writing checks to poor people or whatever, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Like, I'm uh, noble. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. That's, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a problem too, that, um, I th that I, I think it is something that probably Slavoj Zizek and Jordan Peterson would agree about that. It seems like a lot of these uh, uh, SJWs or whatever you want to call them are like rich, rich, privileged white kids at really elite, expensive universities complaining about oppression at some of the safest places in the entire history of the world. It's hard not to see a lot of this woke pathology as privileged people guilt reduction. Like, because I think I think guilt reduction, and that's also something that uh, Zizek talks a lot about. He talks about how when you go to Starbucks, baked into the price of a cup of coffee or something like that is the guilt reduction of knowing that, oh, well, you know, these beans are sourced from an ethical plantation and uh you know it's sustainable and stuff like that basically yeah what's the value that's being produced is not only a cup of coffee but the notion that i'm making the world better even though i'm buying into the system that's destroying the world it's basically that little token amount of guilt reduction that allows you to feel comfortable about your consumption, even though that's the real problem. And I feel like this oh, woke stuff, yeah. and I feel like this woke stuff with uh, privileged people at expensive universities is in that same vein. Yeah, you know, I know we're both huge fans of South Park. This is making me think of like uh, the whole thing that happened with whole foods and that that entire season of south oh, park sure. really with where randy where randy gets woke <laughs> it's so hilarious oh, gosh that season is just mwah, like so the 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 height of the series in my opinion is so good yeah yeah it's so awesome all the all the stuff with pc principle and uh, that's one thing that's great that's so awesome about south park that no one is safe. They make fun of all sides of an issue when they're when they're making when they're making fun of things that are going on. A hundred percent. Yeah, they have no yeah. friends in Hollywood. They make fun of everybody. Yeah, exactly. Oh, so I forgot to I forgot to ask you this before. Um, when you were mentioning, uh, I think it was uh, Zizek's Pervert's Guide to Ideology. You mentioned that he talks about Ramstein too. What what does he think yeah. about Ramstein? So this is actually something interesting that I agree wholeheartedly with. So he talks about how Ramstein will kind of play very a little bit with Nazi imagery. Like uh, when he shows a live concert and he shows the lead singer of Ramstein kind of like goose walking on stage. And he talks about how what they're doing is actually very productive in the fight to dismantle Nazism. And this is actually something that I really agree with. And basically his point is that when we're talking about destroying an ideology from within, what we really, what the most potent thing we can do is take the elements of it that are not problematic as such and take it away from that. So for example, with Rammstein, like goose stepping on stage and like playing with that libidinally, there's nothing offensive about that or even like socialism as such. But by kind of lampooning Nazism, by taking those elements of it that are independent of the more 
you know, horribly problematic elements of it and reclaiming it from them through parody is probably the most potent way to defeat it. And that I think is very important because I think all too often people, well, it used to be on the right, but now it's on the left. People on the left will say that the best way to defeat an ideology is by making people unable to talk about it at all or unable to recognize it, trying to bury it, but you can't bury an idea. Yeah. That'll that makes it more attractive stronger. to people. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 That's, that's interesting. What you were saying, what you were saying made me think about uh, what made me think about Foucault actually, because in, uh, in something that I, uh, that I wrote for one of my videos on his book called history of sexuality, he was talking about language and power and I was talking about how, you know, people say that Foucault think that every Foucault thinks that everything is about power and power is always bad. But I think a really interesting point that he makes in the history of sexuality is when he talks about how power is not always bad. It can be it can be used for. And I always mention this quote too. He he's certainly not a Marxist because one of his quotes is "government is the only fatal form of power." That sounds more like an anarchist to me. But anyway, in terms of power, he he talks about how, you know, the people who don't have power can use it, can do things to gain power, in which case that power is good because they're gaining power against the against the people who are using power against them. And a, a really interesting example of this in language is the N word and how, you know, it used to exclusively be used by uh, by white people to be racist against black people, and it still it still is that way. But in a sense, um, hip hop artists reclaimed the meaning and the power of the word by changing the end of it to an A and using it as an expression as an expression of like brotherly love or something like like this is my buddy or just meaning like a guy. And now they're allowed to they're allowed to say it. But uh, but white people are not. So they took the power back from that word in a positive way. I 100 percent agree with what you said. And oh, man, I'm going to get in so much trouble for doing this. But <laughs> I, 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 th I, th I think that actually the people that are policing uh, who can and can't say that ter term are actually hindering the progress that you speak of, because I really think that if uh you know we were really uh people that perhaps are not black were able to you know convey that meaning which is you know obviously there's nothing unique about uh a particular meaning that can or can't be conveyed because of the color of someone's skin if we did allow that meaning to be communicated by people that aren't just black i think that that term would lose a lot of its a lot more of its power and a lot more of its taboo and make it so that when white people say it even with the hard r even in a negative context it would not be as powerful you know it's just like the you know the things that bother me about that is like the whole kendrick lamar thing you know what i'm talking about like he was at a concert there was a kendrick concert and he was singing part of a song and then he put the microphone to i believe it was a white woman or maybe an Asian man in the stage. And basically he was inviting this fan to finish the lyrics, but the lyrics included the N word. Oh, and of, course wow. you're, and of course you're at your favorite rapper. Who's probably the greatest rapper alive right now. Of course, you're going to just like let the passion flow and sing the, sing the lyrics just like you do in your car or in the shower. And exactly. Kendrick, called him out. Kendrick called him out saying, no, you can't say that. And I really disagree with what he did there because it was, again, we should be focusing on the meaning of people's words. And it's so crystal clear that that, I don't remember if it was a white woman or an Asian man, was not meaning anything derogatory towards black people there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's, you're reminding me of, uh, I know, I think we talked briefly before about um, uh, when Glenn Lowry and John McWhorter talk about this exact subject. Like I've seen um, 
John McWhorter in particular express exactly what you said. And they're both black guys. And I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, John McWhorter, at least specifically, although I'm pretty sure they both agree about this, uh, but John McWhorter anyway, has said that he thinks this should not be taboo for you to say, even if you're just saying it to say, this is a word, this is a word, the N word, like, uh, like I'll get in trouble if that if I actually say the actual word here on YouTube. Like he yeah. he's he's saying that you should understand the proper context. If someone's saying that this is a word, it doesn't mean necessarily that they're using it in a racist way. If they're explaining that it's a word, it's like it's like Voldemort. Like you can't say Voldemort because it gives it power, but that word, like you were saying, that word does not have magic power. And if you and if you allow people to use it, um, like if they're not using it in a, a racist way and people are more careful about the way that they use it, but it's not forbidden, then it takes some of the power away from it. Right. We have to fight the meaning of the word. And the best way to do that is to disconnect the meaning from the word. And if the word starts to mean something else and we say it more liberally with a separate meaning, a more benevolent meaning, that's how we defeat the meaning. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's why, uh, like, that's why it's so, um, that's why, like, some of what uh, people like uh, Derrida and Foucault talk about in, in terms of language, like how it's historical, it changes over time, and the meaning can change. And this is actually re related to um, like what we were talking about before. Like we're talking about positive examples and then it can be used negatively and can just be confusing. Like we talked about before where people um, like now specifically, like we were talking about critical race theory, even critical race theorists disagree about what the term racism means. And uh, like some of them just mean like basically what Ben Shapiro said, like the consequences of history, the consequences of slavery have disproportionately impact, impacted the black ancestors of slaves. Like that's basically what a lot of them say, but then other people disagree with them about that. So it, it can be confusing, it can be good or it can be bad. And this is like going back to what Foucault said about it, basically like power can be used for bad or good. It's a tool. It's not like an inherently good or bad thing. Yeah, I think I saw one of your Facebook posts where you're either talking about Peterson or James Lindsay, I don't remember, who one of them said that they called wokeism like a, a Foucault cult. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, remember yeah, yeah. I put, yeah, I said that earlier. The Yeah, I was um, I was commenting on a Jordan Peterson podcast from the other from yesterday, which is I think I was saying uh, it's one of the rare podcasts that I liked because I'm a big fan of Jonathan Haidt and he was talking with him. And he and Jonathan Haidt and uh, Steven Pinker, my favorite part of that conversation was when they were all uh, kind of uh, slightly disagreeing about religion. And um, and then and then I was commenting and saying that uh, I think it was Jonathan Haidt who talked about this Foucault religion. And I said, like, there's no Foucault religion. A lot of these SJWs have never even heard of Foucault and uh, like. He and, and Jordan Peterson uh, uh, talk about how, you know, they don't believe in truth and saying that a lot of what Foucault was talking about is kind of the opposite of, of, of what a lot of these people are doing. Like I, I've mentioned before that um, in, in terms of like the identity politics, politics, for example, I think he would have been totally against that because his he criticized the category of homosexual for being created because putting homosexuals into a different category from heterosexual people means that it highlights them as being different. And during the enlightenment, the institutions of science and religion declared that this category of homosexual was sinful and medically flawed. So I think he would have been like really against a lot of this wokeness stuff and I, and I also said um, he was a like he wasn't a relativist about truth, as people like Jordan Peterson have said before. He was a pluralist. And I said 
uh, which Jonathan Haidt himself has said he is before, because I've seen him say that on uh, either one of his lectures or one of his TED Talks before, which his pluralist perspective on truth actually is what put what the postmodern perspective on truth is which is actually also what jordan peterson believes in because jordan peterson that super long ass debate that he did with sam harris where they were disagreeing about truth he was talking about how there are different types of truth truths there are scientific truths there are moral truths philosophical truths there can be religious truths that are scientifically false and i agree with all that I think he, that, I think there are plural different types of truth. Yeah, this Foucault thing, I think my conclusion is basically the same with the Marxism thing. It's just a mess. Yeah. And, and the reason I say that is because, so, you know, you and I discussed James Lindsay last time and my assumption, although I haven't like checked James Lindsay's work in detail, my assumption is that if Lindsay is in good faith and does check his work as much as he says he does, it's likely that a lot of the thinkers that really propelled this woke movement forward did cite Foucault, uh, you know, not completely, because as you said, Foucault mm -hmm. didn't only think that uh, power was bad. And so similar to the sense that people will cite Marxism to talk about people who believe in absolute egalitarianism, people will cite Foucault to say that all power is bad and power is dispersed everywhere uh, mm -hmm. even though it's not a complete, and, and again, like my challenge to Peterson would be like, why frame it this way? Why, why is it, is it even productive? Like, what's the purpose here? Cause yeah, cause obviously like, like if anyone, if it's to stop people from reading Foucault, then that's a shame because as you said, there's a lot of value to his work and a lot of things that Peterson would probably agree with. Yeah. And yeah. so it's unfortunate that he does that. And I think that that's probably the more, probably the more valuable criticism than saying that he's wrong necessarily because yeah, all these things are so, yeah. That's a, that's why, that's why it matters to me that he's wrong for sure. And yeah, I mean, I mean like he's, he doesn't, I mean, the, like you were saying, the, um, I think that I think that's true. The more I've been reading about all of these different types of things, I haven't seen it in critical theory at all so far. But in in one of the critical race theory books that I read about intersectionality, which was a compilation of what different authors were saying about it, a few of them mentioned Foucault. But every time they did it, they would you they would talk about this one small aspect of it, and then go on to a whole bunch of other things and include it as a whole bunch of factors in along with uh, include it along with a whole bunch of other factors in what they're talking about or they would take this one aspect of Foucault and criticize it and try to turn it on its head which is just like as we were talking about earlier that's what philosophers do they take ideas from people and they and they deconstruct them and they put them back together in a way that suits their ideology. It doesn't necessarily mean that any of them would even call themselves Foucaultians or, or however you would call them that. So like that to me is just, is just cherry picking to demonize philosophers and create this seemingly coherent ideology that I think is just like really less coherent than the way like in a, than the way it's being presented like in a way people like James Lindsay in particular are giving people giving the people who have woke ideology more credit than they deserve because their ideology is much <laughs> less coherent than the way that he presents it. You know, I think there was a very telling moment in the Peterson Zizek debate that people don't often talk about. And that's the part where towards the end, Zizek brings up like, well, what does happiness even mean? And then Zizek says, you know, in order to have happiness, an essential element is basically having this big other in Lacanian terms or a scapegoat that you basically blame all of your problems for. And Peterson agreed very sincerely with that notion that in order to find happiness, you need some kind of a scapegoat. And I don't know if he's doing it intentionally, but I feel like that's why Peterson is doing this with Foucault. 
And it's a shame because, as you mentioned, he is cherry picking and you can just as easily, perhaps even easier, cherry pick the genealogy of horrendous things going on today and trace it back to Christianity. Like, you, you, I mean, that's probably the best way yeah. to beat Peterson is just shove that in his face. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's <laughs> a good point. Yeah, like a lot of it is like, I don't know, some some sort of like, uh, I don't know, pure puritanical fundamentalist Christian religion. Like a lot of people have compared it to that. Like, uh, like John McWhorter, who we mentioned has compared it to a religion too. And it, it really, like wokeness really is like that in some ways. And you could compare it to Christianity similarly in that um, like Christians kind of agree on like every or at least most type of Christians tend to agree on maybe a small number of things. But other than that, there's a hell of a large variety of different perspectives on Christianity. And there's a lot of vehement disagreement about that too. So it's, it's, it's similar in that way. Right. Yeah. You could, I mean, I can't do it in my mind right now, but I'm sure if I, you know, sat down with a pencil in like 10 minutes, I could blame Christianity for wokeness. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. That's it. Like you can pick, you could, even if you wanted to, like you could blame all of the wokeness stuff on any of these specific things. Like you could blame all of the wokeness on only postmodernism or only Christianity or only critical race theory or only critical, uh, only critical theory or only Marxism or, but if you combine them all together, then it's like, Whoa, dude, this is like this really evil ideology and they have the, and they have plans to, as James Lindsay has said on Thaddeus Russell's podcast to Sovietize America. And then, you know, it gets into these like conspiracy theories of, bro, they're teaching CRT to our kids in school and they're teaching us to hate America. <laughs> yeah. Cause Lindsay believes that the Frankfurt schools, Alf Haven, their culture, is basically or, or wokeness is the project project product of that project and the thing is is maybe i'm giving lindsay a little bit too much credit but i think that a lot of people that criticize lindsay for that position are saying yeah because it's a conspiracy theory because it's ridiculous you know it's like there are no people at the top of these universities who are like you know praying to the frankfurt school books saying like <laughs> oh we are doing we are doing your duty marcuse and we are inverting culture to bring about a neo-marxist future that's not happening but i do think that perhaps we underestimate just the power of their insights and how we can almost unknowingly be performing their project uh, or like the goals of their project. That's where I think that Lindsay's hypothesis like is maybe bordering on convincing in that there Wait, is who, no conspiracy. Whose project? Marcuse in the Frankfurt School. Oh, okay. Like the, uh, okay. the Alf Haven der Coulter thing. Like, you know, we must uh, invert the West's culture in order to destroy it from within. I, again, I don't think that in order for it to be a conspiracy... We don't need these professors to actually have a secret agenda. Or I'm sorry, that, that is what it needs to be to be a conspiracy. However, there's a very charitable reading of Lindsay that I think suggests that, well, it's not necessarily that there are, you know, mustache twirling professors that are enacting this. It's just that the power and the legacy of the Frankfurt School's ideology is kind of doing that without their necessarily needing their necessarily needing to be like a explicit mission to do it. Am I making any sense? I don't know that. I think I, I think I get what you're trying to say, but I think like to me, that sounds like, like his theory of what is hap what is happening with, uh, with critical race theory or wait, no, his depiction of, um, what people, uh, what um woke people would say is happening with critical race theory or systemic racism like there's no there aren't any mustache twirling people but there are people who are perpet going around perpetuating racism 
without meaning to and this is a, and this is like evil in some way like adding this moral analysis to it like you're you're unwillingly fulfilling the goals of the white supremacist agenda or something like that's what that's well, why like that sounds similar to that to me which is why it sounds like conspiratorial like not i get i get not that i get that it's not like people people twirling their mustaches in a smoke-filled room or something like that. Right. But I'm just saying that sounds similar. But I think that what you're saying is important because that's why I think oftentimes people will say that even a police department that is full of mostly African-American cops or black cops can still be systemically racist. It is because of what you just described. You know, again, we don't need a white cop at the top uh, twirling his mustache for the structure, for the institution to still be subject to the same traditions that cause, you know, a an output or a result of racism. So I think that in a sense... It, so the, doesn't that sound like he's sounding like the people who he's, the way he presents people he's criticizing though? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean that that's the strange thing, right? Is that in a sense when people say that uh, academia is completely overtaken by leftists and or and people who say that police departments are completely overtaken by racists or if academia is systemically left-leaning or police departments are systemically racist, they're all talking about the same kind of philosophical process or you know the same you know what I'm saying? Like, so even though they're on the opposite sides of the political spectrum or the ideological spectrum, ultimately they're endorsing the same idea of, you know, oh, kind of like how, um, how there's, there's can't, there's left-wing cancel culture, but also right-wing cancel culture to, to use like a yeah. different type of example. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, for every, uh, I don't know, James Franco comes to mind, you know, there's also a Colin Kaepernick. Right. Yeah. Or like, uh, a, like a funny, a funny right wing one was, did, did you hear about that? Uh, uh, I forget what her, oh yeah. There was a, a porn star, uh, a porn star named Brandy Loved, who's a, a conservative Trump supporter porn star who tried to go to this like, um charlie kirk turning points usa event and she was turned away when they found out she was a porn star <laughs> oh that's rough yeah <laughs> uh, yeah i don't know why do they do that is uh, yeah I, yeah that's I mean, like look, exactly look. The, exactly what the what the left does that they criticize like the left is eating itself well yeah you're eating yourselves too <laughs> yeah yeah like it would probably it's a mess. it would probably <laughs> attract some lefties if you had like a uh, a porn star supporting conservative ideas like maybe they would think but w well it depends on the type of lefty you're talking about i guess because there are those who are pro sex work and there are those who are against sex work but uh, like there are definitely those who are pro sex work like you could say that um it, like you could say don't you want to be sex positive and support this porn star? Like, why do you want to demonize this porn star? Be sex positive. Yeah. And I, and I wish that people on both the left and the right would, well, first of all, I wish they would stop moralizing and, you know, not turn people away based on what they do for a living, but also just recognize like Ben Burgess often talks about just the strategic benefits of inviting these people into your movement mm -hmm. yeah yeah like if you want to uh, appeal to uh, a broader audience and the funny thing about that too is that uh charlie kirk who runs turning point usa is all about attracting a, a younger audience like look conservatism is young and hip kids <laughs> <laughs> you would think that would attract a younger audience does it i don't know i mean i Obviously, the guy seems to be doing well. Everybody knows who he is. He's got he's got a fan base, right? I have no idea if they're young. No, no, no. I, I mean, I mean uh, I, okay. sorry, sorry, I interrupted you. 
I was gonna say I highly doubt that it's a bunch of boomers listening to Charlie Kirk. Oh yeah, no, I'm not saying that. I I mean um uh like knowing uh, like promoting a porn star for being a Trump supporter might might attract even more mm. younger people. That's what I'm saying. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, it's it's so funny. I I like I like watching Ben Shapiro's reactions to this type of stuff. Like when he was criticizing uh Cardi B for her wet ass pussy song. <laughs> That meme <laughs> so, of the Shapiro's wife being dry was so funny. <laughs> yeah, it was so hilarious. <laughs> it's it's unnatural for women to get wet when they're getting aroused. My, I never yeah. wake, I never make my wife wet. It's it's not normal. It's unhealthy. You should see a doctor. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's so funny. It's uh, crazy. I mean, Ben Shapiro. It's it's crazy how successful he is. Yeah, it is. He he's got like the fourth biggest Facebook page on the internet. That's I mean I mean that's I'm trying to find a way to describe how powerful that is. Cuz I mean Facebook is basically like the biggest marketplace in the world, you know, other than maybe Google and having the fourth biggest Facebook page, I mean, you can go into any investors uh any investor and say that and they'll give you as much money as you want. Yeah. I think Facebook I mean, I don't, I don't, skews Facebook skews towards older audiences like yeah. like boomers specifically, right? And I think they're they're more they maybe boomers on average tend to be more more attracted to right wing ideas. But then in terms of like the social media aspect of that, a lot of what he does is just like make it's just like make fun of the absolute worst examples of lefties which is right. easy to do tons of people on the left and right are being super successful just demonizing right. the other side and making them look totally stupid right and he's not the only one that's profiting off of the culture war i mean that's one of the that's one of the reasons why it's so hard to defeat it because there's such a strong profit motive yeah yeah exactly like the um, like the, that's the way that that's what the algorithms incentivize. They incentivize conflict. Well, they incentivize whatever's going to keep you on the platforms for the longest, but what tends to, uh, what tends to keep people on the platform for longer is getting into fights with people and seeing things that make you angry. So you can spend all day arguing with probably some like 14 year old in, in their parents' basement who think who thinks that they understand things more than you and maybe they've just been like looking up articles while they're playing wikipedia and you expect that they and you're like this person is so goddamn dumb i can't handle it i must respond <laughs> yeah and it yeah, i mean you're totally right with the algorithms but i mean it's not only that but it's well i think the algorithms reflect something that's unfortunate about human nature in yeah. that people are more inclined to want to support you if they feel like that a they are part of your tribe and b your tribe is under attack by a another tribe and so in order to defeat the other tribe you must you know support your tribe with increased you know vigor you know mm -hmm. I, I like all those guys on youtube like awaken with jp I mean, God, his content now oh, is just yeah. entire, entirely just, uh, I don't even get it. Like, I mean, look, I mean, I'm not one to say what, you know, I'm not one to say like, oh, you can't find this funny, but I just don't even think he's making jokes. He's really just taking the kind of like, just kind of dramatizing the, uh, kind of the rights perspective of how the left is wrong and adding some sarcasm to it and people just eat it up. Yeah, and also, you yeah. know, and, 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 you know, the formula is like, you know, it, it's like do that. And then, Oh, big tech is coming to censor me or the woke mob is trying to cancel me because it gives yeah. people more uh, incentive and more immediacy to support, support, subscribe, click that bell mm -hmm. whatever yeah yeah the i saw you, you guys uh um talking about that on your episode on your channel about uh political comedy and i think i commented about it yeah he when i first heard about that guy 
it was back before he was doing that stuff and he would make he would actually make funny videos like he made the, this first one that i watched was called something like uh if meat eaters acted like vegans and it was before the carnivore diet thing became popular so it almost became a self-fulfilling prophecy but he was he was acting like a vegan but talking about meat i only eat meat vegetables are bad for you and like some stuff like that that he was making fun of was really funny but then like you said he just be he just became like oh okay so i'm super right wing now so i'm going to say that all of left wing ideas are like radical marxist communism trying to destroy society and that's what everything is involved with and you know joe biden is super woke and everything is woke and i'm going to add just a little bit of sarcasm so that it seems funny and basically just only appeal to exclusively a right-wing audience, or at least uh, an audience who just hates the wokeness enough to watch that kind of stuff. My hypothesis, and again, I could be totally wrong. Uh, I mean, again, if somebody watches this, watches him and laughs, I mean, who am I to disagree? But I don't even think like people are laughing at the sarcasm. I really just think that people are so filled with disdain and hate for the opposing opinion that it's just very nourishing for them to watch somebody prove that they're dumb or at least perform oh, yeah. that they're dumb. Oh you know, yeah. Like, but I when, think you're right. It's like cheering them on. Yeah. Take down those evil lefties. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They are that dumb. Yes. They are yeah. that dumb. Here's money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Fighting yeah. the good fight, bro. Did you know that Joe Biden is a communist? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's it's unfortunate um, that there really is, you know, because I know, I, I mean, I, I understand the desire to make a living, make a good living being an influencer. And it's really hard to once, you know, especially if you've been struggling to do it for so long and then the opportunity finally comes to you, but it requires, I mean, I don't think he's, I, I don't necessarily think that like, you know, he made this Faustian bargain of like, okay, I'm going to do it. I think he's just kind of been uncritically just, you know, kind of fell into this thing and he actually really believes in the value of what he does. And, uh, you know, so do many other people, but it's just mm. a shame that, so much of the culture war is just like a snowball effect where, yeah, the algorithms are already increasing the tension between the two sides and then the, and then the financial incentives to even make that divide more toxic, just, just feed into each other and it just gets worse and worse and worse. And I'm even experiencing yeah. some of this too. Like I have plenty of people in my comments saying that I'm not a real leftist or, you know, this and that, like, it's also a very safe thing to pick your tribe and to say, all right, yeah. well, I'm just going to align myself with everything that this tribe says. Therefore my comment section are only supportive. And, you know, mm -hmm. I'm not, uh, yeah. no one, I'm not being attacked by people who are trying to question my moral integrity. So it's just, there, there's a, there's a hundred reasons to, to play into the divide and to increase the divide and very few reasons to try to stop it mm -hmm. or at least incentives. Yeah. I mean, there's plenty of reasons, but there's very little incentives. Yeah. Yeah. I really uh, like, I really hope that I never get that way. I'm always thinking of that and trying to, trying to think, okay, well I did that. So I've got to do this on another perspective. Like, um, uh, like for, for example, with Ben Burgess, we talked about like, criticizing James Lindsay and Jordan Peterson and stuff like that, of course, last time. But next time, uh, one of the things I uh, that we're going to make to sure, sure to talk about is cancel culture, especially because he wrote that, that his most recent book was canceling comedians while the world burns. So it's not like, uh, like I want to make it, I want to make it clear, even though some people think I'm like this Uber lefty that I'm not just like this lefty who buys into all this, cancel culture shit and i like some right-wing ideas or like right-wing thinkers too like like glenn lowry who we mentioned and, and thomas soul some of his books are really interesting too like um black rednecks and white liberals is a really different one because it talks about um kind of the differences between different types of 
cultures within the same races of people throughout the history of the world. And they're like, and, but then, like you said, it can be difficult too, because it's so easy to just get angry about stuff and just uh, build your following off of anger and stuff. And I, uh, I get tempted. I get tempted by that. By that, sometimes, sometimes too, just as much as the next person. I I hope I never become just like a fucking grift machine or something like that. <laughs> yeah, the word grifter. I have. I really struggle with that term, and I feel like it's a term that's maybe unfairly leveled at influencers because, like, I mean, show, if our definition of grifter is somebody who is doing something that they don't authentically believe in for money, I mean, is that is that how you would describe? Yeah, them? I would say so. I would say so. Like, okay, then yeah, like that's, every that's lawyer, pretty accurate. Ninety nine yeah. percent of lawyers are grifters. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> so like, but 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 they don't get that kind of criticism. It's only yeah. people on the internet. That's true. Yeah. I mean, like, it's, it's hard to, and the, the problem with that label too, is that people, uh, people call that, calls someone gri a grifter if they, if they just disagree with their ideas sometimes too. And then, it, but then if you legitimately do think that someone is a grifter and they disagree with you, then they think that you're a grifter for calling the other person a grifter or something yeah. like that. Like what one of one of few people one of the few people who I think actually is a grifter is Candace Owens because she says such ridiculous shit that I cannot possibly believe that anyone does that. Like I was I did a podcast with a few of my friends a while ago and we were watch it we watched the start of one of her videos in which she was talking about the dangers of cancel culture. And I agree cancel culture is dangerous, but she literally compared it to slavery. I'm like, are, are, are you kidding me, man? Mm -hmm. But then people people accuse me of being a grifter for calling her a grifter, even though I'm not in the habit of going around calling people grifters. Like, it's it just it, it's just hard to... And she's not necessarily... I shouldn't say she even isn't a grifter, because I don't read people... I don't know how to read people's minds. So that's... It, it's really hard to know, like, what someone's motivations actually are. But... I can see, and I can see why people do that, but I, I see people do it way too much too. Like a lot of, um, a lot of lefties who I think are too radical for my taste or call it, call like basically every right winger a grifter. Like how can someone possibly be a right winger? You have to be dumb or evil to be a right winger. Like that's getting way too extreme. That's, that's just stupid. That's uh, like, Obviously, there can be conservatives who have good ideas and general and genuinely believe in them, too. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and that's why I try to stay away from that term. But also something that's really come into focus for me living in Finland uh, is that I, I mean, I've come to the conclusion that if you're born in America and I don't really know what it's like in Canada, I imagine it's similar, but maybe a little bit of a tamer version of what I'm about to say. But if you live in America, man like being a grifter is almost a universal pathology because America is the greatest country in the world to live in. If you're rich, because money, <laughs> yeah, because money is freedom and everybody knows it. And there is such a strong incentive that permeates every part of our society to make money that everyone is a grifter. Nobody is, uh, nobody is really authentically, you know, promoting their values and making money off of it. It's very rare, you know, so I, I just don't even find it to be a very productive or insightful term. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the like, that's one of the problems I have with, um, with some people, like e even some people I like, uh, like, I think we mentioned uh, briefly before when we were, when we were talking about like YouTuber drama and stuff, we were talking about Jimmy Dore and like, I like people who are bombastic like that. And I agree with some of what he says sometimes, but it, it does kind of annoy me. And he, he is the type of person. And there are a lot of other people like that who make giant careers off YouTube because they make valid criticisms of people, but then they get so carried away. And like everyone who ever disagrees with you is a lying grifter. Like <laughs> as if the, as if no one, as if like 
there's this really narrow worldview and everyone who disagrees with it is lying to you and they're a grifter as if you can read the minds of all of these people like you'd have to be able to read their minds or at least see way more evidence than that to be able to know that that many people are lying grifters yeah i mean it's like a it's a growth tactic for him right just get more extreme you know uh get more extreme scapegoat the other guys accuse dissenters of bad faith that'll only increase the uh the uh, what's the word i'm looking for polarization yeah it'll increase the polarization but also the loyalty of your fans and let me tell you yeah. something. i mean i don't i don't know jimmy Dore. what i'm about to say is a com is completely conjecture but I imagine that the last thing in the world that guy wants to do is go back to the Los Angeles hustle of being a comedian because it's one of the most disheartening, difficult, just grinds that you can be in. And he is either he's already achieved it, which I think he has, or he's about to achieve getting a really nice lifestyle from being able to, you know, talk in front of a camera, which is what he always wanted to do. And so, yeah, I mean, you know, that, that's the, that's one of the problems with not having any kind of a social safety net is because if you're Jimmy Dore, you're you're the option is either get more radical and make money or stay true to maybe more humane values and be broke, more or less be broke and be on this really just really heart wrenching dispiriting grind that is trying to make a paycheck in entertainment in Los Angeles. And the other thing is that a lot of these people, I mean, this used to be me. This is one of the reasons why I had such a severe mental breakdown is that once you make it in entertainment in some form or another, it's your identity. And to stop being an entertainer and to stop making your money entertaining and to have to go back and compete in a job market is just unthinkable for for so many people you know it, i mean like that really is a death a death of your identity that you can't even comprehend thinking past yeah yeah i mean the like good for you for doing that man like that that takes balls like the like with that's kind of like what Dave Chappelle did a, a long time ago when he left the Dave Chappelle sh the Chappelle show he left millions of dollars on the table and he stood up for his principles instead of like basically being controlled by the sense by the censorship board like oh well you can say the I think he's he mentioned this in one of his specials he was talking about how um uh the person i forget what they call it but but like the censorship board or something uh, standards and practices oh okay they i think he said that they said um like it's okay to they i'm paraphrasing but they basically express the sentiment uh you can say the n-word as many times as you want on your show but you can't say you can't say faggot so that's <laughs> like that's one yeah, of the, the things the line was he said well why can't i say it and they said well, because you're not gay. And then he says, well, I'm not an N word either. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 That was, that was a total mic drop standing applause or standing ovation moment yeah. for Chappelle in my book. Yeah. 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 Dave Chappelle's awesome. Yeah. Still, still my hero, despite all of the people telling me how bad of a look it is. <laughs> <sighs> so stupid. It's so like uh, I know you didn't want to talk about this, so I'll just say my. I don't, so I don't, I don't care. I mean, if you want to, I'll I don't just, care. I'll just I'll just say my, my thoughts. Like, um, and I, I think I probably said this elsewhere before, but it, like to cut to still claim that he's transphobic if you've actually watched that fucking special is just fucking insane to me. Like he's talking about the the trans comedian who he said he would give a spot to every time he's in town and he was like mentoring her as a comedian and then she and then like she killed herself almost undoubtedly majorly due to people on twitter telling her to kill her telling her to kill herself or telling her that they would kill her for supporting dave Chappelle. and like when he told that when he told that 
story that was that was like the only serious part of the special when he finished telling that story that's why i I've, i commented everywhere after i watched the story this is the only comedy special i've ever it's it's not my favorite comedy special but it's the only one i've ever seen that made me laugh hysterically and cry because when he said that she killed herself i was like holy fuck that's fucking heartbreaking like yeah how, how the fuck can you think he hates trans people after that that's just fucking crazy yeah, the only other comedian that I've ever seen that's able to really transition from just trivial, comedic, offensive laughter to then like really heartfelt introspection is George Carlin. And I, I think yeah. in a lot of ways, I, I think in a lot of ways, Chappelle is the um, the kind of spiritual descendant of Carlin. And yeah, um, yeah. well said. Yeah, God, I, I I felt like I was gonna say something about Chappelle. Uh, fuck, what was I gonna say? About uh... sorry, I haven't eaten dinner yet, so my brain is like a fog. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is what happens when you get old. Um, I thought I, yeah. I thought I was stoned. No, I wish I was stoned. It's, uh, <laughs> can't get that shit in Finland, or at least it's not easy to come by. Not as easy oh yeah, as you, were tell, Angeles, you were telling me that last time. Yeah, really nice yeah. to have a weed store, like, and just be able to go. Oh, I'm running low on weed. Better go to the weed store instead. Instead of like, uh, you know, text this person. They come to. They come to your house. You go out and give them money, and then also if I go to the store, like I can go to the liquor store. It actually drove down the cost to the point that legal weed is now less expensive than illegal weed was before it was legalized. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for all the ways that Finland is progressive, that's one thing that they seem to be a little bit behind the times on, especially considering how big of a problem alcoholism is in this country. Oh, I didn't know that it was a big problem there. Yeah, I mean, Finns love to drink. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, it's good that um, I think uh, I think I heard you say somewhere before that they have a good um, uh, socialized healthcare system there, like they do here in Canada. And I, I think I heard you say somewhere before that, that that's one of the reasons that you moved there, which is like a good idea. Like I. My my American my American friends who I talk to all the time like all of them agree like it's hard to find an American person in in my opinion that actually supports their their healthcare system like I I, I don't get it it's it sounds fucking awful like and my yeah. my mom has had a lot of serious health problems for many years and she has to go to the hospital on a fairly on a relatively regular basis, like usually at least once or twice a year. And sometimes she's had to stay in there for like a week, a week at a time or like longer than that. And I, I can't even imagine how much that would fucking cost. Like we do, like my entire family would be homeless, like or bankrupt or having to live with relatives or some shit like that. Okay. I remembered what I was going to say about Chappelle. If you want to go back to that. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Uh, unless you don't want to, it's your show. What do you no, 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 go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So I've seen a lot of criticisms about Chappelle say like, oh man, he literally did the, I have a black friend defense. <laughs> um, and honestly, I know this is, I I'm, people are probably going to roll their eyes heavily. And I think I'm probably taking a huge risk in admitting this, but I really heavily disagree with the notion that or I think it's just extremely cynical to suggest that there is nothing productive about having a friend that is part of a marginalized community. Like that mm -hmm. there's no actual value in me saying that I have trans friends or I have a black friend. I mean, first of all, if it's it, now saying it just as a fashion statement, saying it if it's not true or just saying it to protect yourself from criticism, that's one thing that deserves to be criticized. But I mean, yeah, if you have if I have a friend who's a trans person, I mean, I think that is a like a pretty strong indicator of character and willingness to, you know, listen and uh, understand the struggles of people that experience life differently than I do. So all of this mm -hmm. like 
all of this uh, very sarcastic criticism of the idea that, oh, just because you have a friend of this marginalized group doesn't mean you're racist. I mean, maybe that's true, but we shouldn't disincentivize people from reaching out to marginalized communities and making friends with these people. I mean, have we lost our fucking minds? Yeah, yeah, that's a good point, man. Like, and if you get, if you actually get to know some of these people, you can see that, like, it, almost no one is is the the way that they're depicted when they're when they're demonized by people. Like, it, like if you're if you're racist against if you're racist against black people, like there's the there's this guy Daryl Davis who I'm a huge fan of. He's a black jazz musician and. He's made a career out of converting Nazis and white supremacists by becoming friends with them because this guy's, he, this guy's he, like fat. I think I know who you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. He's fat yeah. Like, there's yeah, a I know great documentary. Yeah. There's a great documentary about him, which I think, yeah, I think it's called accidental courtesy and he's, uh, he's, and how it always works is, you know, they, you know, uh, maybe they go out for a drink with him or something, and then gradually their friendship builds, and then eventually they realize, hey, maybe this one black guy is okay. And then maybe eventually they realize, hey, if this one black guy is okay, okay, maybe there, maybe some of the other, maybe some of the rest of them are okay. Maybe they're not all bad. And then maybe it can, and then often it progresses from there to the point where they stop being Nazis and white supremacists and. KKK members so like it can like if a trans in, in a similar way if a transphobic person becomes becomes friends with a trans person that's probably gonna at least do something to yeah you know entertain the idea that being a trans person is not such a bad thing like it's if you actually do especially if you actually do form a genuine friendship with a trans person I mean, I would go farther than that. I would say it's the most powerful way to defeat transphobia, more so than getting shamed on Twitter, more so than, you know, reading the correct books or listening to the correct, you know, and I say correct here in, in parentheses, the correct, uh, you know, uh, uh, lecture from a professor. We're talking about identify or, or recognizing other people as human beings and I know this is going to sound silly, but there's no better way to do that than literally recognize going out and recognizing someone as a human being, you know, interacting with somebody. And I fear that uh, the left or the right, whoever the fuck is saying this shit has we've just gotten so deeply sarcastic that we've literally disincentivized people from doing anything other than just virtue signal and get angry. You know, like, because that's what's going to score us more cultural capital than actually doing the hard work of, yeah, going and befriending someone, which, yeah, I'll always argue is going to be the most productive uh, thing to do if you're trying to, you know, bring people together and, like, erase the stigma of difference. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, like, you can you can come at this from so many so many different angles, too. Like, the, you can uh, you can use that as um uh, criticism of, uh, of like woke, a wokeness take on racism in a way too. Like what things that something that a lot of people, a lot of people know from actually knowing, uh, a lot of like lower class black people is that a lot of, a lot of them actually had problems with like the black lives matter riots and shit like that. And people like sometimes like, especially like the woke prog the like woke progressive upper class white people think they're standing up for people who they often disagree with like a like one of a one of my black friends is super fucking annoyed by all this like wokeness wokeness shit like that and and if you actually get to know people who are in these demonized categories you can see that uh obviously when you put people into a category, but you actually go and be and get to know those people more than and more than one of those people, you see, oh, they're just as different as every other category of people. It's not like they all agree about the same political ideology. That would be crazy. Right. And that's why I think the left has 
I mean, this demeanor has like ruined, I think, what is ultimately kind of a very benevolent message in movies like Green Book, movies like uh, what's that one? It's a, like I think it's a French movie about like a rich white aristocrat in a wheelchair. And then he's got this caretaker who's this black uh, lower class guy. You know, what movie I'm talking uh, about. I'm not sure. It was like I think it won the best foreign picture oscar like 12 years ago or something like that point is this is now considered like a oh i have a black friend movie by the left and i think that that's they're doing a real disservice to the progress that has been made and can continue to be made yeah yeah like uh, it's so like if you can't if you can't if you're fighting a, if you're fighting a battle that you can't win and there's no end point then how are you going to convince people to follow your ideology if like you can't do anything but if you can't possibly do anything right that's what gets people disillusioned with like left way like this sort of thing and wokeness is what people what gets people disillusioned with left wing ideas in general because they start to think that like all left wingers or all left wing ideas are like this. So then it can push people to the right, which is like the opposite of what you should want to be doing. If you want to have your political ideology reach some, some level of increased success. Right. And it gets perversely authoritarian when I think that some people would be happier with me if I put Black Lives Matter in my Twitter profile. I don't have Twitter, but like put it in my profile and put my pronouns in my profile more than <laughs> if I actually went out and tried to like meet and befriend trans people or lower class black people. Like, and, and, and that's mm -hmm. just like a complete, I, I think just priorities are in the Ooh. wrong place, man. If you want to care, if you want to actually care about trans people, uh, do do what I told you I've done before before and become okay become okay with uh saying yes to trans people on dating apps. You gonna go do that? You're gonna go go on a date with a trans person? Because the Man, like, I've been I was swiping right on this one trans person here in Helsinki and they have not swiped right back. So I'm I'm trying, man, but they're just not, <laughs> they're just not into it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, as you as I as I, as you know from when I told you, that doesn't necessarily say save even that doesn't necessarily save you from getting labeled as transphobic, which is crazy. Yeah, because there's nothing that they want you to do except agree. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I got to run before I pass out from not eating dinner. But uh, okay, Andrew, yeah, always thanks. a pleasure. Always a pleasure, brother. Yeah, thanks for talking, man. This was uh this was a lot of fun as always. And yeah, as like always. we were uh, we. Were, as we like we were saying before uh yeah the next time we talk we should talk about that nicholas cage movie vampires kiss because i haven't seen it and uh i i love that like i said on your uh your actor ranking video with austin the other day that you put him in s tier because so many people hate nicholas cage so yeah <laughs> that's so okay, awesome. just just do just do me a favor don't watch any clips there's a bunch of clips okay. on youtube from vampires kiss just just you know wait till you see the whole movie okay yeah for sure i'll do that yeah, so right. thanks again for talking with me, man. And I'll, I'll say all the stuff I like to say at the end of the videos here. And then you can uh, give any last words or plugs or anything there. And so, yeah, thanks to everyone for watching. Hope you found this as interesting as we did. And thanks uh, for subscribing. Please subscribe. Hit the like button. Hit the notification bell, uh, notification bell to be notified when I come out with other videos. I'm going to do another um, critical race theory discussion with my friend Dusty, who got me into reading more about critical race theory, and uh, the the author Peter Salmon, who wrote a biography about Derrida called An Event, perhaps, that I've talked to a few times before. And then on the weekend, we're going to do the first of what are probably be probably going to be three episodes of that new and super popular Netflix show called Squid Game which is, uh, is really interesting and has a lot of obvious philosophical and political messages in there too. Have, have you seen that? I haven't. I've actually been watching mostly Finnish movies.
which oh, very interesting. Great, which, which vary greatly in quality. <laughs> oh, cool. Interesting. Yeah, so um so check that out too. And uh, check out my Patreon too, please. The link is in the description of this video, as it always is. And like I always say, I love you all. Keep being the tiny beam of light that shines through the almost impenetrable darkness in the universe. And most importantly, always remember this. The funk cures all. And groove is in the heart. And Slavo Zizek is awesome. Check out the tons of his videos that are on YouTube. And attempt to read some of his books, even though they can be difficult. And... Uh, the wokeness sucks and Dave Chappelle is awesome. And yeah. Anything else uh, you want to say there before we end it or, uh, oh, oh, check out, check out Jared's channel too. It's Jared Bauer where he's been doing some of those cool videos that we talked to, that we've been talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, nothing more to add. Uh, we'll, we'll get you on the channel soon, Andrew. I apologize for our, technical mistakes last time uh but yeah i can't wait to talk about vampires kiss man any excuse i will cool man day or night i yeah, will talk vampires kiss cool man maybe we can do that in like a couple weeks or so if that sounds good yeah sounds good man all right cool thanks again man and thanks again everyone for watching and adios until next time